most of you have a far that I would say that most of you have a far more challenging life than what my wife and I have had. I mean, yeah, we've done some pretty seriously crazy things for God over the years. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had our own things that have gone on, but we, we haven't had the extended family pressures that you have in the same ways. We haven't had all of the, the kind of challenges you face in growing up and living in this culture as you have done. But even so, you could there could be people in this group tonight who went through similar kinds of, 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 of stresses, similar kinds of difficulties and tests. And part of those people might say that we have a tremendous marriage today because we trusted God together through the processes. And some of us would say, no, it isn't so good. We let them get us down. So the, the difference isn't so much the, the circumstances or even the culture that we're in. The difference is in for us from a Christian viewpoint, how are we responding to God in our marriage? And that means individually, individually, you know. Um, I should mention one more thing here that happened in a church that I was in years ago. Uh, uh, this church was going through some trouble, and I felt like I had a word that might help them. Uh, it was here in, in Malaysia. And uh, so I shared this word that I thought would help them in, uh, in, in, the, in the church. Now, at the end of the meeting, uh, it was a pretty big church. Uh, at the end of the meeting, this guy comes up to me, and he says, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. Oh, that was such an anointed message, Pastor Mike. I said, well, thank you very much. He said, yes, I hope they heard it. Do you see the problem? <laughs> That's called the pointing of the finger. And uh, we don't want to do that with what we're hearing tonight. What I'd like you to do is hear it for yourself and uh, and ask, ask the Lord while we're going through this, is there something that I could do to contribute to the, a better health and a stronger and more successful marriage for the two of us? So that's the one thought we want to hold on our, in our minds as a key thought. But here's the key question then, based on what I just said. What can I do now to make our marriage better? Because there may be something that you could do right now. Maybe yours is just great and you're happy. But the, the question you want to keep in mind is, what can I do now to make our marriage better? Now, with those things in mind, I'm going to try to show you now three marriage models. Uh, all of this stuff that I'm sharing with you tonight, unless I... I quote a source came from my own little brain up here, my little bolt I had uh, it, it, over the years, just different things that we've looked at and tried to find ways to share them. So we're going to take a look at three marriage models now that most of us will fall in one of these three categories, right? So here's three boxes for you. And here's marriage model number one. Marriage model number one is what we're going to call the parallel marriage. Uh, that's the one on your left there. You see the couple right, the, right, right at the bottom. It's like a little ladder, isn't it? Well, here's what I want you to picture. On their wedding day, the two say, I take you and you take me and we get and they get married, you know, and they start their happy life together. Uh, because they're in the Klang Valley and because they're in contemporary 21st century Malaysia, they are probably both working a job. So they have two separate jobs that they're doing. And so uh, they, they have to find ways to connect in their marriage uh, because uh, he's on one path and she's on one path in their marriage relationships uh they're 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 not hardly ever are they working together in the same business as they used to do in in family businesses years ago so they're they're both uh they're they're both doing something that's different and so they wake up in the morning and they uh they kiss each other goodbye i hope and and uh maybe if they have time they have a cup of milo together and then off they go um uh, and then they come back at night and they see each other after a long day of work. Now, the tendency of this parallel model to marry, it's not necessarily bad. And many couples have been able to sustain uh, a parallel model of marriage for a lot of years. Uh, but if you look at my diagram, you'll notice that uh, at, at the bottom, at the beginning, the connection lines are closer together. Because when, when they first get married, they're, they're, they're loving it. And they like to be the idea of being together. And so they find ways to connect. Uh, and uh, they, they, you know, maybe they come home each day and they talk together. They, they, but they, they find some, they have a meal together, anything they do. But here's where the problem comes in that I've noticed. The problem comes when in a parallel marriage, you just start having less and less meaningful connection times as husband and wife. And you have more spaces for uh, misunderstanding to develop. 
because you have the less connections and less good conversations. Uh, and there, that could be for any number of reasons. It could be because you know the children come along and they take some of your time. Uh, the it could be it could be a, a legitimate thing, uh, but whatever causes it, the spaces get farther and farther, and the 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 meaningful points of connection uh, are are less and less. Uh, a meaningful point of connection can be anything. We'll talk about that uh, later on, but uh, it just means times when the two of you are connecting as a couple not around anything else and not because of anything else, just you guys, you just want to doing something together. You know, it could be anything uh, that, that, that you do that creates a sense uh, or helps you to remember the closeness that you have as a couple. Now you can see that the, the danger in that model is the distance in between the connection points uh, as you go up. And, and if, if we're not careful uh, and some couples aren't the parallel marriage becomes a divergent marriage. Now, uh, that happens because now both of you have separate jobs and separate interests, and then eventually you start having separate friends that you don't know anything about. And uh, the guy stays out for work after work, goes out with his friends. The lady, maybe she's got her own set of friends, or they've got their own little you know, arenas that they work in, and they are diverging from one another. Uh, and so th th they're no longer connecting. They're on separate paths. And it's in the divergent condition that affairs happen. Affairs don't usually happen in a parallel condition. They can, but they don't usually. But they do happen often when the marriage is in a divergent condition. And you're thinking, well, that, that could happen in the secular world, but what about in Christian things? Absolutely. Uh, my wife and I met a couple when we first came to Asia in Singapore. They were on the staff of a very big church in Singapore. Uh, if I named it, you'd know it. Uh, at that time, it was kind of the church. Uh, and they, I was told by the man who introduced them to me that they were the most committed and godly couple that we would ever meet in our lives. That's what they told us about them. They were not in full-time ministry. He worked for a company. Now, she actually was uh, the uh, executive assistant to the pastor in that church. But uh, they weren't both like in full-time ministry. But they both were responsible for one separate network of, 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 uh, of cell groups. So he was over one network of cell groups. She was over another cell, network of cell groups, right? And I remember when my wife and I were down there seeing them one time, because we used to go down and stay there when we had to get out of Malaysia for a break uh, every three months. Uh, we were staying with them. And uh, this wife said to us, my husband is the biggest hypocrite in the world. What? She said, yes. She said, uh, we act like we're these very spiritual people, but the fact is our, our houses are rotating like a revolving door. I am going into one set of meetings. He's going into another set of meetings. He he pretends to be able to give big offerings because that's what expected of the leadership. He said, She said, our bed, we, have, we haven't slept together for a very long time. There's no physical intimacy between us. Now, this couple was involved up to their eyebrows in the work of God, in the work of the church. And so I told her one time, I said, you know what you should do? You should go and talk to your pastor about this because I'm sure he'd be able to help you. And so later on, I found out that she had talked to her pastor and he said, you must press through. You must press through. You must press through. Now, there's a place where we press on. There's a place where we endure. There's a place where we keep going forward. But there is a place where we have to stop and pay attention to the things that are important to God. And the things that are important to God are not just the ministry you're doing or the money that you're making, but it's the, it's the marriage that you have because he's made you one flesh. And they weren't doing that. Well, later on, I talked to her again and she said, oh, it's all better now. I pressed through. But that wasn't the end of the story because eventually she became very embittered and she became an enemy of that church. Uh, so I, I don't think that we want to get to a divergent condition in our relationships. Uh, and the parallel model is strong as long as you pay attention, but it's kind of up for grabs. It could go, uh, sorry, it could go either way. Let me get my earphone back in here so I can hear me. Uh, it, it, it could go either way. Now, the model that we see in the Bible is the model I'm going to give you now. This is the one that we're, we're aiming for. 
And that's the intertwined model. And now, you know, that's kind of like a strand of DNA. Now, here's what the intertwined model looks like. Uh, in in uh, Ecclesiastes, the scripture that we've used in marriages so many times, uh, a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. One could put a thousand flight, two could put two thousand a flight, but a threefold cord is not easily broken. Now, the idea here is that the couple start their marriage relationship and they say, let's be intentional about connecting our lives so that we are two people living two parts of one life, not two people living separate lives that touch each other occasionally, like the parallel model, but we are two people living separate lives, separate one life in separate ways. And we are connecting that way. It doesn't mean that either one of them loses their identity or gets swallowed up by the other one. Somebody asked me that in a seminar one time. Uh, do, do they do you get swallowed up in the other one's identity? No, you, you you're still individuals, but you're you're weaving your lives together through the the help of, of the Lord. And to do this, you have to be very intentional. You have to think we, not just me. Uh, and when you think we, not me, that means that you're going to find different ways to connect and to protect the intimacy that God has given you. So uh, if you ask me which of these three models my wife and I have, we have the middle model. Uh, we do. Now, we have had we have time for that, and we've been able to develop that kind of a marriage. And we're thankful that we have it, because we, like that song said, we, we sometimes don't know where one, one starts and the other ends. You know, We help to make each other all that we could be, but we could find our strength and inspiration independently it's the way that we work together that sets our love apart so closely that i can't tell where i end and where you start now that is true of us but we recognize that we've got more time and more uh more years uh behind us but i've also known couples who had very different lifestyles than ours who built an intertwined marriage an interwoven marriage so that they're making each other stronger for all the things they face in life they're not living independent lives of each other like in a parallel model and touching every now and then they are together uh, th there's lots of ways you could do that and we'll probably talk about some of those in just a minute but just in case i don't get to it one thing you can always do is pray for each other and you can pray for each other in the in the in your the realm of your work you can pray for each other in all the things that you're facing you can you could do that and make that a part of your life you can share things together you can you know just text each other every now and then during the day uh to to uh reach out. There's all sorts of things you can do. And to a great degree, what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this session has to do with building an interwoven marriage. So that's the model that we're looking for right now, because an interwoven marriage is an intimate marriage, an intimate marriage. Uh, and here, please don't think of intimacy only as what happens in the bedroom or wherever. Uh, it's not just about sex. Uh, an interwoven marriage is, is an intimate marriage because it, it gives us the unique togetherness that is only possible in marriage. Uh, when the Bible calls a married couple one flesh, that is describing a unique kind of intimacy that they and they alone can have. It is uh, a different kind of intimacy than parent and child. It is a different kind of intimacy than uh, siblings. It's different from every other kind of intimacy that's possible in human relationships. Uh, it's unique because it's a one flesh relationship, the Bible tells us. So it's the unique togetherness that is only possible in marriage. Now, because it's a unique togetherness, it is also a very strong togetherness. It is a very powerful togetherness. It is a very positive and redemptive togetherness. It's a very healing togetherness, this kind of intimacy that we build in marriage. Uh, I, I'll go back to the song again. We help to make each other all that we can be. So this kind of an interwoven marriage actually makes both people in it stronger people, not weaker people. One does not, uh, uh, you know, consume the other. Both are working together to become and, and stay the people that God wants them to be within the context of this unique relationship that they have together. So that's what we're aiming at and what we're going to be talking about uh, in, in this session and, and into next week. Now, for that to happen, uh, we might want to ask ourselves, well, what can we do? What are the qualities that we need to have to build a marriage like that? One of the, a marriage that actually is an interwoven marriage. Uh, so I'm going to give you today the beginning of seven 
positive qualities of interwoven marriages. Seven positive qualities. Uh, we don't want to be like this one man that I heard about who uh, they at his 50th anniversary uh, party, they uh, they ask him, um, uh, you know, you, you you and your wife have been married 50 years now. Uh, we've never seen you, uh, you know, argue. What what what's your secret? We've got to know because we fight a lot. And the husband said, "Well, it all started on our honeymoon. We went to this place up in the mountains where they let you ride horses, and uh, they gave me a very nice horse to ride, but they gave my wife a very difficult horse, and she got on that horse and the horse threw her on the ground, and she didn't get angry." She just got up and she patted the horse and she said, horse, that's number one. And then she got on the horse and the horse a second time threw her on the ground. And she didn't get angry. She just got up and patted the horse and said, horse, that's number two. Wouldn't you know, he said, it happened a third time. She gets on the horse, the horse bucks her off, throws her on the ground. She said, horse, that's number three. Reaches into her pocket, takes out a gun, Shoots the horse dead. I looked at her and I said, you crazy woman, what is wrong with you? She said, husband, that's number one. Now you can see that is a way of keeping peace. But it's not, it's not what we're after today. We're looking for something a little bit better than that is. Just a little bit better. So we're going to look at this list now. And I've, I've been teaching this list for a long time because it's real to us. And I think it could be real to you too. So let's see what we can do with the next little part of time that we've got here. Uh, the first of these qualities we're gonna talk about is trust. Now, I've been teaching this for a long time, but then a few years ago, I came upon some material by a man named Dr. John Gottman. Let me tell you about John Gottman. If you look real closely, you'll notice that he's in that picture, he's wearing a little yarmulke. He's a Jew, he's a practicing Jew. He's also one of the foremost uh, uh, researchers in marriage and family in the world. Uh, he has an institute called the Gottman Institute, and they have studied couples for from, from the beginning of marriage all the way up through 30 years of marriage. They've been able to study couples, and, and they've done re different kinds of studies. They have what they call the marriage lab, where they have couples come in and just interact on camera so they can learn what it is that's happening in these couples and then they, they uh, my wife actually took some training from the Gottman Institute uh, that she wanted to use uh, for a course called uh, Couple and Baby to help couples know how they could build a strong marriage so that when the baby comes, the marriage doesn't fall apart, you know, and sometimes it can't because that's kind of a crisis point for a marriage. Uh, but uh, John Gottman uh, divides up marriages into the masters, those, those who are doing well, and the disasters, those who aren't. And so they decided they would try to find out what were the, the, the factors that they could identify in these marriages. Now, these were not all Christian marriages, of course. There were some of them were people that did were atheists, maybe, you know, they all, all different levels of, of uh, life, all different beliefs, all sorts of things. And um and so they they said, what is the quality that that we can see that will or qualities that that make the difference between a, a successful marriage? and a failing marriage and one of those was trust so i was interested in this because it was kind of the foundational one that we talked about so here's what john dr john gottman had to say about trust and i'll read this to you it's not a it's not an audio uh if i could see it let me try in here right what i found was that the number one most important issue that came up to these couples was trust and betrayal. Number one most important issue. In other words, do they keep their promises? I started to see their conflicts like a fan opening up. And every region of the fan was a different area of trust. Can I trust you to be there and listen to me when I'm upset? Can I trust you to uh, choose me over your mother, over your friends. Can I, next dream, can I trust you to work for our family, to not take drugs? Can I trust you to not cheat on me and be sexually faithful? Can I trust you to respect me, to help with things in the house, 
to really be involved with our children. And no, no, when I read that to you, you're probably thinking all of those things have to do with trust. Actually, they do. And that's what he felt, that that when couples get married, they have expectations about what they can trust their partner to do for them. And, they, and that boils down to actually being there and being a part of their life so that they're not doing life alone. And it, it boils down to not betraying one another. So uh, that's why we think trust is so important. If you want to see more of John Gottman's stuff, you can find him online. And uh, there's a, quite a lot of YouTube videos by John Gottman that you can see online as well. So I wanted us to see that, that even researchers find that this issue of trust is extremely important to marriage relationships. So that leaves us to two questions about trust. Uh, you know, I had to ask these because that's kind of what I do. Uh, question number one, am I a person who can be trusted? Am I trustworthy? Am I worthy of trust? That's question number one. And question number two that comes up for us is, why is, why is it hard for me to trust? Uh, and I'll share a few examples about that with you in a minute, maybe from our marriage. But those are the two things we want to look at. We're going to take them one at a time. Uh, am I worthy of trust? Am I the kind of person that that my wife or my husband can trust? And to, to understand that, we're going to be, uh, and, and are we the responsible promise keepers? Now, let me see if I've got the right slide in here because I just hope I do, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, let me tell you about responsible promise keepers for a minute. Uh, you have a, we have a word in English, spouse, right? And uh, I never have liked that word because I don't like the sound of it. It sounds like mouse or louse, you know? And I just don't love the sound of it. I just don't, I don't like it. So, you know, some words you like, sometimes, sometimes you hate. All right, until I looked it up. And I had this book called The Dictionary of Word Origins. And in that book, I looked up the word spouse. And it comes from a Latin word, spondere. And the word spondere gives us several words in English. One of those words is a solemn promise. So a spouse is somebody who makes a solemn promise. That's how we got the word. That's how we got that ugly sounding word. It means somebody who makes a solemn promise. And then there were a couple of other words that came out of the word spouse. One of them was our, our spondere. One of them was the word uh, responsible. That means somebody who's doing what they should do, right? And uh, another word that came out of spondere was responsive. So now we're getting a picture of what a, a, a good spouse can be, a good, responsible promise keeper. They are responsible, they are responsive, and they keep their promises. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about trust, to have that kind of an atmosphere in our marriage relationship. But it's something you have to build and you have to ask God to help you with it. Now, to, to just get an idea of what it looks like, let's talk about the first one. Am I worthy of trust, right? Now, for this, we're going to use an acrostic on the word respect. Uh, what is the kind of person that can be trusted? Uh, and we're going to just take a look at these, these uh, letters together. First of all, if I want to be a trustworthy person, I will be reliable. That means I'll be predictable, I'll be dependable, and I'll be truthful. That's what reliability is. You know, uh, when you drive your car, you definitely want your car to be dependable so that every time you start it, it starts and that it doesn't just break down in the middle of the road. I had a Wira one time and that Wira was not dependable. I bought it for 10K from a, a dealer here in, in uh, PJ, uh, Planajaya, and uh, that, that car was not reliable. I was on my way to preach at Holiday Villa in Sur Sundra's church one Sunday. And every time I would slow down below a certain number of RPM, the car would die on the LDP. This is not fun. On Sunday morning, it's not as bad as it would be at like rush hour, but this car would die every, you know, if I slowed down to make a turn, not even stopping at a light, the car would die. You know, if I, anytime I got below a certain level of, 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 uh, of RPM, it would die. Eventually I found a mechanic who could help me to make it. But when you don't know what to expect, uh, you, you can't rely on it. Uh, it's not reliable. And then the second thing about that, uh, that is you have to be predictable. Now, some people hate this word. You know, they want to keep the, their partner off balance all the time because if I'm predictable, I'm boring. Now, I'm not talking about getting into a rut here. 
where you're just doing the same things all the time because you do them all the time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being able to predict what a person is going to do so that you can trust them to do it. You know, uh, they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to one time be there and the next time not be there. There's a, there's a, there's a sense of reliability in the relationship that gives you security as a husband or wife. So uh, if I want to be a trustworthy husband or wife, I will be a reliable person who's predictable, dependable, and truthful. I don't tell lies. I don't try to hide anything from my husband or wife. Uh, the second one is ethical. And that means a person who knows what is good and does it. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but you will have much more security when you're married to somebody who is doing good and knows what good knows what good is and does it because you have so much less to worry about. Psalm 37 says, trust in the Lord. Amen. We all want to trust in the Lord and do good. The two are together. It's a couplet. You know, in the Hebrew there, it's a couplet. You trust in the Lord. But one of the ways that you show that you trust in the Lord is by doing good. And the promise of that is you're going to dwell on the land and you're going to have all that you need. So an ethical person is always uh, going to get ahead in the world because they're not cheating. They're not hiding anything. They're not playing any games. They have nothing to, nothing to be ashamed of if they're caught. They, they, they know what is good and they do the good. Now that makes you a trustworthy person. The third one is sensible. A sensible person is somebody who's gained wisdom by being teachable. And one of our, one of our greatest dangers in life is to become an unteachable person. And usually we become unteachable because we become proud. And we, we resist the, the, the wisdom that would make our life better. All of us can do that a little bit. But I'm talking about if you develop a life that is characterized by uh, being unteachable, uh, you're going to be hard to live with. Because there are things that you could learn if you would learn them that would make your life and your wife's life and your children's life better uh, or your husband's life better. But you don't want to learn them. So a sensible person is gaining wisdom by being teachable. The fourth one is patient. The patient person is one who's willing to wait for the outcome and persevere. They're not rushing to one new thing, trying to make things happen all the time. They're, they, they develop a pace in life. They could be very, uh, they could be uh, pursuing a goal. They could be uh, going after a vision, but they're willing to do that at the right pace and to persevere, even if it takes longer than what they expected. Now, the reason that is important, and we're going to get to that in the next one, being economical, is because if you're patient, you're not going to go into debt needlessly to try to buy things or to make investments that you don't really need because you're hurrying very fast to make a lot of money before you reach to a certain age. You're, you're not going to make foolish decisions. So patience really does protect us uh, and, and, uh, and makes it easier for someone else to trust us because they know that we're not going to just rush ahead on an impulse, right? And then the fifth one is economical. And that means that somebody who knows how to manage money, uh, whatever that amount of money is, whatever the context is of your life, they know how to manage money. They are not managed by their money, but they manage the money that they have. They know how to give to the work of God. They know how to invest. They know how to be willing to, to uh, use less so that they can eventually be able to do more. Uh, so they're economical. And then uh, th this person that can be trusted is a caring person. And the reason I put that in, besides it fits my outline, but, but it means they're not self-centered. Uh, and that shows a true concern. It is very difficult to be married to somebody who is self-centered. My wife and I don't know somebody very, very well who is married to somebody who is so self-centered that she became a narcissist and only cared about herself. Only cared about herself. So the caring person has allowed Jesus to free them from the selfishness that would make them self-centered and, and, and is, has allowed the Lord to make them a person who really cares about the person they're married to. That sounds a lot like love, doesn't it? Doing the thing that will help. So you, you, you want to be a caring person. And we've, believe me, we've met people in this country over the years where one or the other of them was no longer caring. Uh, they, they wanted to be married and they wanted to have all the trappings or things that belong to marriage, but they, but they, they weren't caring anymore. Uh, 
I'd like to tell you that that can be resurrected and it can, but you have to be willing to let Jesus do it in your life. You have to let the spirit of God do something in you to make you a person who really does care. And then the last part of this respect uh, acronym that I'm using is tested. And that means a person who's improved by their challenges. Some people become bitter because of challenges. And as we all of us preachers say, eventually, sometime, some people become better because of their challenges. Now, you know, if you're first starting out and you're not married yet, you don't know whether this person's faced challenges or not, but you can take a look at their life and you can say, well, you know, did they, even if they weren't the best of students, did they give up on their, on their schooling? Are they always making excuses? Are they always blaming other people for what they could not achieve? Or are they pressing forward, even though there are obstacles to overcome? We had lunch today with a lady who, uh, whose son uh, just graduated from Leeds University in the UK with a master's in law and passed his bar at the same time with distinctions in both. And uh, you wouldn't have thought that, they, that he could have even gone there. She's a widow. Uh, her husband had been has been dead now for nine years. She didn't know what kind of money they were going to have. She didn't know how God was going to meet the need for this. And yet this young man uh, and, and her, they trusted God together. And then he went and he persevered uh, and, and faced the challenges and, and developed character as a result of that. So those seven are the qualities that we want to ask God to help us develop in our life. And, and a note about this, nobody arrives to where you can say this is, uh, I'll never have to worry about this again, because it's always possible for us to slide away or slip away from one of these values. So maybe you want to ask yourself today, am I still willing to gain wisdom by being uh, by being teachable? Uh, do I still know what is good? And am I doing the good that I know? Just you know, just see what was happening in your life so that you you can uh, you can ask God to help you change if he needs to. So that's how you can tell if you're a trustworthy person, at least one model that you can use to do that. Now, what about when it's hard to trust? What do you do then when it's hard to trust? And why is that so? Why does it happen that we can be so hard for trust? Well, a few things that we can think about. It's possible that you have been in other relationships, not just uh, romantic or marriage, but other kinds of relationships uh, where you were betrayed by somebody in that relationship, whether romantic or not. And oh my goodness, the stories, the stories about this. But let me just tell you one. Uh, one of my Bible school students in the United States was a guy who went on to become a pretty well-known Christian entertainer and teacher. Uh, he was kind of more of an entertainer than he was a teacher, but he was he was around. You probably heard of him, but I won't give you his name right now. But he was at a Bible school that I was teaching in for a while. Back when I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, a long time ago, <laughs> there was a time when I just I was just about as dumb as you could be, but I was still teaching in this Bible school. And uh, this guy told me one time that he had trust issues. I said, why? He said, well, when I was four years old, we were walking, my dad and I were walking down the road and he picked me up and put me up on top of this wall that was about four feet high. So it's you know taller than him. And he said, jump to me, jump to me, I'll catch you. Jump to me. And the little kid was so excited about jumping to his dad that he jumped off the wall and his father moved out of the way and let him hit the ground. He's laying there crying. How inhuman. And um, he said, his father looked at him and said, son, that's my lesson to you to never trust anybody. Now, maybe you never had anything that bad happen to you, but maybe you also had promises broken or betrayals or somebody who was you were supposed to be safe with became a predator and you became the victim. Now, that could happen and that could make it hard for you to have a, a, a good uh, trusting relationship. It could be because of bad examples from your family and your acquaintances. You look around you and you think, who's got a good marriage anymore? Where are the good marriages? This one's ending in divorce. This one, they hate each other. Well, they don't talk about it. This one, they're sleeping in separate rooms for the last five years. You don't, and, and you start looking around, you're thinking, is it even worth it anymore? 
You know, is, is it even worth it to, to even consider marriage? And so you could have had bad, bad examples from your family and, and, and acquaintances you're with. And the third possibility is you're having trouble trusting because of internal irrational fears. Those three things can be the reason for it. Uh, I'm going to just come back to this again because I believe it's so true. I believe in every one of those three areas that if you ask him, Jesus will help you. I believe that the Spirit of God is willing and able to help us find freedom from all three of those things that keep us from trusting. The one that I had the most trouble with of those three was irrational internal fears. Now, my wife is a very trustworthy lady uh, with money, with with everything. And there's, you, know, I mean, you all know Diane. Well, she's always been that kind of person that could be trusted with anything. But when we were in our early years of marriage, I had this terrible time trusting her with money. I just, I, I, I was, I was, I, I was asking for too much accountability. I was, I, I wanted, I wanted to know where every cent went. When we went to the grocery store, I wouldn't buy two tins of anything, only one. Uh, and and Diane was really grieved about this because I was so controlling about our finances. And um, that, you know, we had several arguments over, over, you know, at different times over those first early years of marriage. And then I remember one really bad argument that we had about it. And we weren't even at home when it happened. I think, Diane, correct me if I'm wrong about this. I think we were in a town where I was about to speak at a church. And we got into an argument about this. And I'm thinking, oh, man, huh? That's close enough. That's, Diane said that's close enough to the facts of the case. And so we just had this big argument. Now I'm supposed to be the anointed servant of God. And I'm 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 just you know, and we had this argument about it. So finally, I said this to Diane, which I never said before. I said, Diane, I don't want to be this way, but I don't know how to change. And for Diane, a little light bulb came on. She said, He doesn't want to be this way. He's not doing this to be mean. He's doing this because of something that's controlling him inside. And I will tell you the truth, that from that moment on, that irrational internal fear of not having enough started losing its power over me. It didn't happen in a second or a moment or even a month, but over a, a relatively short period of time, that never became an issue for us again. It went away. It just went away. So I believe that God can do that. And uh, can I can I tell you a little bit about another couple that we know? I, I'll take the time to do it. It's worth the story. Uh, there was a young woman from in, here in Malaysia. We, we met her almost by accident, except it was a divine appointment. And uh, um, Nellie will know who this is, so I'm not going to mention the name, but Pastor Nellie will know who this is. Uh, she was staying in a kampong house, watching the house for some other people. And the man who was living in the next house over was a, a bad guy. Uh, and uh, he would come over to the, when he knew that she was there alone and he would make sexual advances to her. And, uh, and, and, and so, and she was par par you know, just paralyzed by this. Here's what happened. She had been sexually abused by her mother's, father uh, uh, boyfriend her father figure uncle she had been sexually abused from the time she was 12 all the way up through her teenage years and that messed her up uh she was betrayed she couldn't be she she told diane one time we got to know her very well and we had lots of times to pray with her and talk with her and have her over to her house and let her you know, be a part of a fairly normal relationship, as normal as any relationship could be that I'm in. Um, and, uh, and you know, one time she said to Diane, Diane, I have never known healthy touch from a father figure. And it was, I mean, it was that bad for her. And she told us, you know, she said, I don't think I could ever be married because what I experienced uh, sexually uh, outside of marriage uh, you know, with this person has has hurt me so badly. But you know, God did a healing work in her life, and we we were not responsible for all of this. She was going to get some good counseling, and and they, they were helping her through. And finally, one day, she was at her house, and she said, "You know, if I ever do get married, I want to marry a blue eye." Which she meant, what she meant like a masale, you know. So she wants to marry a blue eye. 
And we thought, yeah, that'll happen. Uh, that's never going to happen. Not too long after that, Operation Mobilization was sending their ship up here from, from uh, Singapore. And they sent some people in advance uh, of, that, of, the, of the trip. And one of those people was a blue-eyed man from Finland, never been married, son of an elder in his church. And the two of them met. And eventually the two of them got married. And now they have two kids. And he's on OM staff in Finland. And she's learning, uh, working at primary school uh, uh, there. This is a tremendous story because of what God did in her life to deliver her from betrayals and, and what happened during those relationships. So the question at this point is, can God do things in us that make it possible for us to trust even though we've been broken? Yes, he can. Do the bad examples from our family mean anything? No, because you didn't marry who they married. The person you married to has no intention of being unfaithful to you. So you shouldn't carry that fear from what happened in other places into your own relationship. Those are all ideas that we need to hold on to when we think about building trust. Now, uh, let me see where we're going from here because I want to see if we've got enough time to do anything else or whether we should just stop. Maybe we could take one more and then I'll wrap it up. I'll just try to make this a little faster than usual. The second thing that helps us develop intimacy is delight. See, you won't build an interwoven marriage with anybody that you don't trust. But if you can learn how to trust each other and develop trust, your marriage will get stronger as your trust gets stronger. So, you know, now the other thing is you you won't build an intimate marriage, a strong, close, personal relationship with somebody that's, that's not fun to live with. You can have a marriage with them, but you can't have a, a, a marriage that you really enjoy. You won't really emphasize the, 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 the closeness of it uh, if you're not building delight into your marriage relationship. So let me define delight this way. It means the joy that lubricates the gears of the marriage machine. It's the laughter that makes the hard times easy. It's the things that you share together that are just your own private little joys in life. You know. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is this one. How can I, me, today, become a more enjoyable partner to make life more pleasant for you? That's, that's the delight question. How can I become a more enjoyable partner and make life more pleasant for you? And to help you to do that, I'm going to give us a little assessment here, and then we'll, we'll stop and take some uh, questions or whatever we need to do. So here's, here's our, our, is everybody okay, by the way? I can't see all of you, but is, is this going okay for you? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so how can you become a more enjoyable person? So the question we're going to ask for now, are we dull or are we delightful? Those are the two words. You know, have you become somebody who's blah, you know, to live with? Or are you a person that still in you know, they still enjoy being with you? Are you a delightful person? Well, let's find out. Number one is a test. So you do your self-evaluation here, right? Uh, number one, I cannot remember the last time my spouse and I had a good laugh. That's a warning signal. That's a warning signal. In in, in the Constantine marriage, there's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of laughter, and we're so glad for it, you know. And and sometimes there's been some laughter in some very tough times too. So uh, ask yourself that: uh, are, are we still laughing together? Right. Number two, my friends often tell me that I take myself too seriously. That means that you're way too intense about things that don't matter. You're 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 just always and probably concentrating a whole lot on on little micromanaging and little details. You're, everything is too serious. You can never just stop and laugh at something because it's all too serious. It's all too important. You know, I think that happens sometimes to people who are wrongly spiritual. They're wrongly spiritual, so they can't really find any joy because they're 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 too busy being intently spiritual. And sometimes I'd like to just tell them, why don't you just relax some of this stuff that you're doing, stop being so much of a Pharisee, and let God bring His joy into your life again. You know. Number three, uh, I often forget birthdays and anniversaries. Now, I know it's not as culturally uh, necessary to do that in Asia as it is in America, but we're doing it more. And I'll tell you the reason that I think it's important and why I put it on the list. Uh, I think it's important because uh, a birthday or an anniversary is a day that we can just say, we're going to, on this day, we're going to remember how much you mean to us. 
Uh, and we're, we're not going to just let those slide by and become people who don't celebrate those moments in life. Celebration is a, a great help for any marriage relationship. So I often forget birthdays and anniversaries. That's number three. Number four, I cannot remember the last time I gave my husband or wife a pleasant surprise. I'm going to move my, my thing here so I can see you guys again. Uh, a pleasant little surprise. Sometimes we give people bad surprises, but one of the ways that we can make marriage enjoyable is with good surprises, you know, and uh, good surprises don't have to cost a lot of money. They can, they, they, they can be just a small, small thing that you do. It could be a text message that just says, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you right now. I know that you're in a meeting, but you can answer me, but I'm praying for your meeting right now. It's just something that you're doing that, that is a nice little surprise. Uh, my wife, and I'm, I'm so thankful for this. My wife is, a lady who loves simple pleasures. When we first started dating, our very first date, I had no money. And I was going to take her to a banquet at our university. And you're supposed to buy the girl a flower, corsage, you know. Well, I didn't have a lot of money. So on my way over to see her, or like we were going to have a, a Coke date, like a coffee date before the big date, I stopped and I picked one sprig of baby's breath out of the garden at our school. And I took it to her and I said, uh, this is your corsage for the night of the banquet. It was a joke because I really was hoping to scrape enough money together that I could buy her a proper flower. And I did. But when I got to the door of her house, she was staying at home then. When I got to the door of her house and she answered, there she is in her beautiful formal and pinned to the shoulder was my little baby's breath. As if to say to me, I put as much value on this small flower as I would put in a dozen roses. And it does roses. I was talking to a man here in Malaysia one time years ago, and I said, how are you doing? He said, not so good. I said, what's wrong? He said, my marriage. I said, what's wrong now? He said, my wife. And I said, what's she doing? And he said, she insists that I buy her flowers. Now, uh, ladies, you're probably, none of you are like her. You know, that is a dragon woman. She's, and she insists that I buy her flowers. First of all, how can you insist on flowers when flowers are supposed to be a freely given uh, 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 a demonstration of affection? But she insists. I said, so what did you do? And the guy said, I bought her roses. He said, I bought her one dozen uh, yellow roses. Lost me a hundred ringgit. I said, that's fantastic. What did she say? She said, why you buy me yellow rose? Yellow rose for friendship, red rose for love. This lady could not be satisfied. You know, she could not be, and she was very difficult to live with, right? So uh, the thing is, be th the, the small surprises need to be pleasant, but they don't have to be expensive. It's just something that you think about that lets you know that she was, she or he was on your mind. That's number four, right? Just a few more. Number five on the next page. I am more charming to everyone else than I am to my spouse. Uh, do you ever find yourself talking more nicely to other people? You know, my old story of this was the man who's talking to his wife and, you know, she calls him at the office and it's a two word conversation. Uh, 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 down the Now, next, next call is a colleague from another town, a lady. Hello. Oh, Miss Tan. Ah, oh, Miss Tan. So nice to speak to you, Miss Tan. Anything I can do for you today? You see the difference? It's way too big. And I'm, I'm, pardon me if I'm making fun of the culture. I don't mean to do it that way. But this man is a totally different person to his wife. Now, I don't expect him to be like, like he is with Miss Tan with his wife. But wouldn't it be nice if he could give her more than one syllable? And if he could treat her as though she wasn't an interruption in his day? Wouldn't it be nice if she could do that? So uh, six, seven, and eight. My voice has developed uh, an edge like a knife. And sometimes that happens to us when we're under a lot of pressure and we don't realize how we sound. Uh, my wife and I have a little signal word in our marriage for when we feel like we're a little bit stressed and then we could come out sounding a little bit harder than we want to. We just say to each other, I'm feeling a little bit brittle today. And that's just to say, give me a little bit of space. I don't want to be mean to you, but it's just a little brittle today. It just this is not particularly an easy day for me. And that's helped us to to be able to recognize that. 
But if you become a person who's always got a, a knife edge on your voice, you, you need to really ask God to help you with that because it's coming out of your heart. The Bible tells us that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And that means that in our control center, there's some bad programming that's, that's making, us, making us respond this way, you know? All right, number seven, number eight. I have become a nag. A nag is a person who causes irritation through repetition. They say the same thing over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. They never just let it go. Uh, so that's self-explanatory. And number eight, I have become a bully. And a bully is a person who suppresses freedom by intimidation. So if you're a bully, male or female, the other people in your family cannot have an opinion if it isn't the same opinion as yours. They cannot do something unless it's a thing you want to be done. Uh, my wife's sister, uh, youngest sister, was married to a bully for many, many years. And we didn't know it, but this man was emotionally a bully. He uh, he he just insisted on everything being exactly... We, we had noticed that she was a little afraid uh, about not pleasing him. And he was never physically uh, abusive to her, but he was emotionally very abusive to her. So... We've talked tonight about uh, three marriage models, uh, a parallel model, which can be good if you pay attention to it, but can also become a model that becomes divergent. That's our second one. And the intertwined, interwoven model that I think we can develop through some of these attitudes we're talking about tonight. So let me pray for a moment. And then if you uh, have some questions or comments, I'd like to take a look at those. Father, I want to thank you tonight that we are not in this alone, that you are committed to each of us as our Savior, as our Lord, as our healer, and our, as our Redeemer, that you know how to redeem lives from destructive things, restore lives that have been broken, renew promises that have been left behind. You know how to bring us out of darkness and into light. Your Spirit is always working in us for our good and for your glory. And because of that, Father, because of all of those things, we ask you to work in our lives in the ways that are necessary to do in us with what we've heard tonight, what you want to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mike, I think there's a question in the chat. Okay, let me let me go down and pull up my chat if I can find it. Uh is it okay if I stop sharing my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Thank okay. you. There you all are. Everybody okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. It'd be nice to turn on your video, some of you. I see some of the video faces now. Okay. Yeah, nice. Don't be afraid. Okay. You all look very good. Um okay. Uh you have two questions here, and one of these I'm gonna I may have to ask my wife to come over and help me or to get some feedback from some of you in the group about what you think. Uh, but here's the first question. Uh, it doesn't directly relate to what I talked about, but let me just read it to you and then let's see what, where we can go from there. What is an orphan spirit? Because even the children have parents around them, yet they're invisible to them. No mental and emotional support. How do these children become when they turn to their adulthood? Uh, Okay, I don't know exactly what the context of that is because I've never heard that that term before. Um, but uh, let me let me give you what I think about that. I believe that Jesus, through and through and and through the power of the Holy Spirit, can work in our lives to free us from anything that's happened to us in our upbringing. I believe He can. Now, you, you know, most of you know my story. I had three different dads. Uh, I have a uh, I have a, a, a I'm an I'm a, a illegitimate child. I didn't know my mother or my father, but the birth father, birth mother, you know. Uh, I had an adopted father at the time I was 13, until uh, I was 13. When he died, I found out that he wasn't my real father. I had a stepfather after that. So there was a whole lot of stuff going on in me. And I don't blame anybody. I used to. I used to really, really, really blame my stepdad for some things. But uh, as I got older, I got a more mature way of looking at it. And it wasn't wonderful, but uh, it wasn't terrible. In, in some ways it actually was so i brought all of that experience all of that background and all of that fear of rejection uh in into our marriage but let me tell you what god did uh 
because God was working in my life all this time and because Diane was very patient with me and was willing to adjust to me and to be devoted to me, uh, I came out of all of that. I don't believe that if a person is raised in such a way as to, to treat it like they're, they don't exist, as you said, that that's the end of the line for them. Mm -hmm. I really believe that God has a way of working in our lives to bring us healing and redemption and freedom from whatever people have done to us that's mm -hmm. bad. So um, would any of you like to add anything to that? Or Diane, would you like to add anything to that? I, I think that's about it. I can't. Yeah, she's over there on the other side of the room, but I thought I'd give her a chance anyway. So uh, I don't don't let it be the end of your life if you if you grew up may, being made to feel worthless, uh, because the father doesn't feel that way about you at all. You know, he really he cares about who you are and wants to wants wants you to have the best the best possible life that you can have. Uh, the second question. Uh, I'm going to have to ask for some feedback from some of you. Uh, it's just simply, how do you handle a bully? Uh, how do you handle a bully? Now, I've never lived with one, and I've never been one. Uh, but uh, so I just kind of have to say what I think you do. You know, some of you here would, would, would have better ideas because of your experience and because of what God has done for you. I think that the one piece of counsel that the Bible has for us that might apply uh, is uh, is about self-control. We do not want to answer a bully in, uh, in, in, their, in, in the same way that they're coming at us. We don't want to get into a fight with them because they will always win. Uh, we, we can perhaps learn when to step away if that's possible. Now, sometimes with a bully, it's not. Uh, I don't know what else to say beyond that right now. I'd like to think about it some more. Diane, do you have anything that you add to that? No, I really don't. Yeah. It's uh it's a tough situation because you you can't really get out of the house with them. They're 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 there. Uh I'm just thinking about our relative that that we knew that was in that situation. Uh Ultimately, she she couldn't deal with it. Uh, ultimately, for them, it ended. But I don't want that to happen to everybody. So I'm trying to be careful here about what he's saying. Uh, one other thing that occurs to me, though, as we're thinking is, uh, a bully wants you to think that everything is your fault. That's often goes with it. They, you know, you never do anything right. You never do anything right. They, they have to be the ones always in control. It's a controlling behavior and it's born out of their fear, I think. Uh, so they always, they, 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 they're, 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 you know, it says gaslighting you. I'm not the problem, you're the problem. If only you would do this, then I would not be so harsh with you. If only you would have a meal on the table at the right time, then I wouldn't be angry with you. If only, if only, if only. Now the end result of that can be that you start downing yourself and you start feeling like there's something really wrong with you because they're making you feel that way. That's where, even if you can't get out of the situation, the spirit of God can help you. Because you have to know that what this person is doing is not true. They're, they're, they're bullying, they're controlling, their abusive behavior towards you is not based upon anything that you have or have not done. It is based upon them. It's the only way they know to, to approach life and relationships. So if you can somehow just say, God, this is hard because this, you know, this person, man or woman, is bullying me, making me feel useless. I need to to ask you to help me to remember that I am not the, the problem here. Change where you can, do the things that will make for peace. The Bible tells us, but don't let yourself be condemned and don't let yourself become crippled by their accusations. Uh, that that's the best that I I know to say. You know. Um, <laughs> And There's another can, question here. The, this, the next uh, question is just about as hard as is there someone there who wants to come in? Uh yeah. Can can we like uh I'm Joseph, I'm Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Actually, uh I'm I'm a widower, so so I don't I don't have but uh I do see friends having this problem. I mean, if if we get out of this marriage, is it is it uh like like you know, it, 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 we we just 
don't want to be with him already because he is a bully. Really. So is it is it good that we can get out of it? Christian, Christian. Uh, the 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 question of separation and divorce is really too much for me to talk about tonight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, well, it really is. It's it's a complex issue. Um, I don't think it's just a simple issue. I never have thought so, even in all these years of trying to be a Christian uh, teacher and and lead people into truth. I don't think it's an easy answer to know uh, yeah. when separation is advisable and if uh, or when divorce might become necessary. Uh, but um, so I really can't say too much about it now. It's but uh, if he's abusive, I mean abusive meaning uh, physically, I think it's. it's it's good to to get out. Eh? Well, Go yeah, but you have a you have a problem here in Malaysia that comes up, uh, Joseph. That I've seen now. Some of you have more much more experience pastorally than I do in this country. Um, yeah. But I, I have noticed that sometimes, uh, if a, let's just we'll, we'll say that as a woman who's being physically abused by her husband, yeah. my belief is that she needs to get out of that house. But the but in my ideal world, Mike Constantine's ideal world. She would not be have to get out of that house. She and the children would keep the house, and that guy who's abusing her should be made by the authorities to get out of that house, get into mm. counseling, and get the help that he needs. Yeah, because she's not the problem, and the children are not the problem. He is the yep. problem. Yeah, and yet, the, and yet, we we are forced to say to her, she has to get out of the house. Where to yeah. go? If she doesn't have relatives who will support her. Uh, then she can't go to her relatives. And sometimes she goes to her relatives and they scold her. And they say, if you were a better wife, you wouldn't act that way. Go back. That's what you need to do. Uh, and they're, go back they're to not the problem. The, exactly. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's, it's, it's a real tough thing. I do think that if a woman is being physically abused, that she should get out of the house. But I, I would really prefer in my perfect world, if, if he was forced out of the house, and that he had to go someplace and be made to be accountable for what he is doing. I want you to consider this. If he did to any other woman than his wife, what he did to his wife, they would arrest him. That is criminal, what he is doing. If, if, if he slapped any other woman, if he hit any other woman, she could file a police charge against him, and he would be taken in, and life would not be pleasant for him for a very long time. What is it that makes a man feel that he has the right to be a physical bully to his wife? Mm -hmm. Who gave him that authority? Yeah. And uh, see, my my now I'm preaching, aren't I? But <laughs> listen, listen. Let, let me let me go to this point. What is the one reason that I do not, the number one reason that I do not want to treat Diane badly? What is the number one reason? Now, I've thought about this. I got a list. Right. But what is the number one reason? I will tell you my number one reason that I don't want to treat her badly, meaning I don't want to ever, I don't want to be emotionally abusive. I don't want to be sexually unfaithful. I don't want to treat her badly in any way. What is my number one reason? You know what it is? The fear of the Lord. Mm. I will answer to God for this. And when I see a man who doesn't know the fear of the Lord in the right way, then he could do this stuff because he doesn't know. Now, okay, I'm going to be a little bit nicer to him now. Maybe he doesn't know that if he turns to God, God will help him with this. But it's, but it's a. It's can a, I say something, uh, Pastor Mike? Yeah, please. Please, please, please. I, I think many, many people in a situation suffer in silence. They do. Uh, unfortunately, they don't seek help, you see. Yeah. Uh, it's good to seek and seek professional help, marry counseling, rather than to suffer over the years. And yeah. uh, as you said correctly, if any of my daughters who are married, been treated like that. I will deal with my son-in-law in a different way. Mm. You know, uh, you know. So, so sometimes, some of course, uh, the other way also can happen. You know, nowadays we also have a lot of uh, wife who beat up their yeah. husband. Yeah, I've heard of that too. <laughs> uh, 
And That's really bad. I, I think they should seek help instead of uh, suffer in silence. Yes, yeah. Uh, when, Alan, do, you, do you think that the reason they don't seek help is because of fear of shame? That they, there is, Does shame enter into it in your culture? Possible. Yeah. Possible. Uh, depending on their upbringing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, sometimes they rather swallow up their pride and uh, fear because they don't want people to know. Yeah. But if, if over the years you suffer either physical abuse, emotional abuse, even financial, they can use money to even bully you into silence. True. Uh, I think the right thing will be to seek help. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because shame can work both ways. Not only the person who is aggrieved will suffer shame. The aggressor also will be suffering shame if this is openly mm -hmm. uh, made known, uh, especially yeah. in yeah. Asian context. A A Asian context, they, they also don't want people to look at them. So whatever it is, I think it's proper to seek help. If In this context, if you are a member of a church, you should seek the help of those elders and pastors yeah. or yeah. professional uh counselors uh but but the point is uh we this can just go on over a period of time where they have been bullied into submission you know mm -hmm. they have accepted it yeah. as as their lot in marriage until uh things really get out of hand and then they call it off the marriage is out yeah. off yeah. uh but i think they they allow too long before the problem can be yes stopped. yes and yeah. so it's good. Anyone that is out there hearing this, uh, uh, it's good to seek professional help, uh, get it out, ask a counselor, ask a marriage counselor, ask your pastors, ask your elders. Don't don't suffer in silence, you see. Sometimes uh, 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 the agree party don't, don't like to even talk about it. And the bully get stronger and stronger because you know the agree party don't even want to seek help yeah but as i said earlier if any of my daughters are treated that way you know you better watch out you know the father will come in and say you deal with me you know you yeah. know so i'm sure yeah. of course you know i was hoping yes. my son-in-law can listen but they are <laughs> <laughs> no. There. Yeah. no, but well, but you, 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 <laughs> one of the uh, you know the probably I've I've had to uh, I've had to be the person who confronted an abusive spouse uh, maybe twice, and um, in one of the cases I went to him and I told him that we knew what he did, and he broke down and cried and he said, "Yeah, I'm so there you sorry. are." And and I said, I'm so sorry I was this way. And I thought, hey, this is great. He's repenting. But then later, subsequently, I found out that there was no repentance there at all. There mm -hmm. was this, that he said, he was crying as though to say, I can't believe that she has made me become this kind of man. Oh. And he was, and he was crying because he wanted to appear repentant in front of me at that time. But I think, Looking back on it now, I think that what he was thinking was, I can't believe that she has made me become this kind of man. There was never true repentance in his life. Maybe until today, who knows, you know. So it's it's really tough. Uh, there's another question there about living with a narcissist. Uh, and, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, how, how long do you want to be here? <laughs> you know, I there was a time... Uh, I'll just talk to you about this personally now. There was a time that I thought that that was just, that that couldn't be the case. Um, but my wife and I know, know somebody very, very, very well who married, not in, in the case of the person who asked the question, you married a narcissist uh, uh, when she wasn't a Christian, she said. Then she became a Christian. Uh, well, in this case, both of them are Christians when they got married and the, 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 the lady in the marriage drifted away from God and then became bitter against God and then started blaming God for not answering her prayers the way she wanted them answered. Uh, and the, the, the more she did that, the more self-centered she became until she became classically, I believe that she could be uh, diagnosed by a psychologist as a narcissist. 
and uh, this and and her husband would, would had a terrible time living with her because he never knew anything that he did that totally satisfied her. Everything was about her. It spilled over into the relationship with the children. She had to be the best mommy in the world so that she could feel good about being a mommy, not because she was trying to do well for her children. Everything was centered back on her. So we've had personal and intimate experience with a narcissist uh, to the point that uh, one day she wakes up and she says to the husband, I want a divorce from you. I'm sure I can find somebody who can love me better than you. <laughs> mm. And uh, and so they did. Mm. Now, to you, uh, you're married to a narcissist. <laughs> uh, you're probably going to have to go to talk to somebody who knows more about that than I do. You're probably going to have to seek counsel from somebody who really understands that psychologically and spiritually. Uh, you might be able to find somebody that, that like that through maybe Pastor Allen or Lifelong or somebody will know someone you can talk to. Uh, because I think that there are some strategies that you're going to have to learn to when you're living with a narcissist. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. But there may be some help for you out there that I don't have, uh, mm. that I don't have, I can't put in my hands right now. Mm. I hope, I hope that you find it. And I hope that that person realizes what, that their self-centeredness has become destructive to them and to everybody around them. Okay. Any other question that is not listed in the chat? Anyone? Maybe it's a good time if you want to ask Pastor Mike directly. Anyone? Anyone? First, you got to unmute yourself, uh, introduce your yourself, who you are, and then ask the question. Anyone here? Okay. Anyone? No? Very quiet. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can I maybe say this also before Pastor Mike, maybe he want to uh, continue on this. In in marriage, uh, I also noticed as a pastor for some years now, uh, you, you, you find they drift apart uh, because, you see, marriage is a journey yes, where exactly. emotionally, intellectually, mentally, boat has to grow parallel. I, I like the, the ladder that uh, Pastor Mike uh, put up just now. It, it, if you want to climb parallel, then then boat has to grow. Maybe maybe one faster, the other one slower. But but I notice I notice marriages that break up many times are due to one party no longer find itself compatible they use the word oh pastor you know we are no more compatible mm -hmm. but if you dig further into it you you realize that career wise maybe intellectually financially uh, socially one party has gone so much ahead and uh, the other one has been left behind uh, you know uh, career advancement intellectually emotionally over the last 20, 30 years, one party has gone ahead. The other one just are contented to remain where they are. And so this, this is a, a, a bit tragic because uh, marriage is something that both has to grow together. Yes. Uh, uh, and so when one party goes so much ahead, uh, either in business, in investment, in intellectually, uh, emotionally, uh, then they found, hey, hey, you're no more fun anymore. You're no more, yeah. uh, you're no more someone that my my soulmate. I can't talk to you anymore. Uh, so this this is where I I I think you got to take your spouse, your partner along this journey. You know, uh, otherwise one gate behind, one gate so far ahead, they can't even communicate now, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's very sad when you see that happen. Yes, it is. Uh, so maybe, Pastor Mike, you'd like to enlighten uh, the point? Well, in. I, I know that couples uh, couples that are very different in uh, in their in emotional capacity can build strong marriages uh, because they respect the strengths in the other one. You know, 
they they, they do that. Uh, and I know that couples where where one is a very uh, fast uh, thinker and very quick to to grasp things uh, can build a, a healthy marriage with somebody who moves a little more slowly because they are willing to adjust to each other through the process. They have to value the relationship enough that they don't allow the other things to destroy it. Uh, and that's intentional. That's why the middle diagram is, is interwoven uh, because they're, they're, they're interwoving, interweaving the lives that they have. And of course, there's so many different variations of that and so many different kinds of adjustments that you can make uh, for any individual couple. Uh, but it, I believe it is possible for them to make those adjustments so that their marriage is strong, even though they're very different. And they may have very different abilities and capacities. They still value each other, and they respect the other one for what they have, and they and they and they learn from each other. Uh, so I I do think it's possible. Uh, and uh, yes, you're you're right. Sometimes one partner says, "I've outgrown you," you know, or we have nothing in common, and that's when one or the other becomes divergent, and they look for something else. Uh, you know, I've I've heard it said that. Uh, for women particularly uh sexual affairs don't start because of the sex they start because of the attention and the, and the communication that they get and the, the way this person makes them feel like there's somebody worth knowing again which somehow now they don't think their husband has so uh i think it, i think you can build it but it, you've got to be intentional about it uh and i i guess you must have known pastor allen of a case where the fellow just sits back and says, "That's I'm fine. You go do what you want to." All but right. then he becomes, yeah, and he's he's just he becomes a couch potato, you know, and he's he, there's no no motivation in his life except just to keep doing what he's doing over and over again, and she loses uh, uh, interest. I think they can find things to do together that they both enjoy. Yeah, um, I think they can, and I think it's important to do that. Pastor uh, Mike. I'd like to contribute something. Please do, James. Uh, James, James. Yeah, yeah. Carry on, carry on. You know me. I do. I, I, I've heard a pastor uh, mention something like this. Uh, we, we don't marry because the person is beautiful or because the person is uh, talented or rich or is a businessman. We don't base our marriage on that, but it's based on love. Then he, he continued to say, what if one day your wife is no longer beautiful and the husband business fail or the wife may have an accident, uh, she is paralyzed or crippled. Do you still love her? Yeah. That, that is the question. Ah, so I heard this pastor say, and it, it really caused an impact in my heart that uh, no matter what happened, whether the wife even remember you or have forgotten you because of dementia, but yeah. you still continue because the wow we make before God, it lasts forever until death do us apart. So I was very touched by what the pastor shared. Yes. Yeah. yeah I am too, James. In the church that we attend in the United States, there's a, a man, uh, it's very healthy, very strong, quite a nice looking man. And every Sunday, he would come to church pushing a wheelchair with this much older looking woman in it mm. uh, who could not really communicate very mm. much at all. And when we first started going to that church, we didn't know who she was. She was his wife. Mm. And she was suffering from, um, what was it, Diane, dementia? And... Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, dementia and a number of other things. So she didn't really know who he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a chance to talk to him one time and I said, you know, I'm I'm so blessed by the way you you treat her, mm. and you know what his comment was. And I talk about challenging, you know, his comment, James, and everybody. His comment was, mm. "It's my honor to love her this way." Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she had nothing to offer him except a whole lot of days mm. of, of of misery, and mm. he. She passed away about a month ago, uh, and uh, he he just he just modeled for us the very thing that you were talking about, James. Mm -hmm. That that he yeah. he loved her 
you know, when you when you back that off just a little bit and you you just think I'm just talking about, about conversation, but the man who says, you know, how can I make love to my wife? She's put on weight. You know, well, mm -hmm. you're not so beautiful either. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you've also changed. And they're bless the I, I feel sorry for the women who feel like they've got to go for one more beauty treatment and, and get uh, one more slimming treatment so that they can stay beautiful enough so their husband won't get another woman. You know, that's Correct. a very poor kind of husband to have. Look, uh, our relationship is not based, and I, I know this is what you're saying, James. Mm. It's not based, first of all, upon what we look like. Yeah. It's the person. You know, I, I I don't love Diane's body. I love Diane. Yeah. Diane has a body, you know, mm. and uh, but but I love Diane, the person. Uh, and and of course, I'm I'm quite fortunate. I have the best wife in the world. <laughs> but, <you know? laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I really do. She's she's a grand, but uh, but I love I love the person, and I feel the same way about her. She, I've you know, I've got my lumps and I've got my chains and I'm both out now. You know, I used to have hair one time, mm -hmm. and uh, but she loves me, and there, there's something very redeeming about knowing that someone loves you. Yes, not just how you look, or as as you said, mm -hmm. James, or not just what you can do, but they love you. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've we've seen that love tested, and and not, not only in that relationship, but also in Diane's father with his with his wife that she became ill. Yeah, so I hope that when any of us in this group face this, that God will give us the grace that we need to be. Amen. Kind of Amen. Really Amen. Good. Because I don't think I could do it without the grace of God. You know. Amen. Like the vows we say in sickness, in health, in for we better, for poorer. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yes. There's one more question, uh, Pastor Mike. This one is a bit difficult. I don't know, incubus and succubus spirit. I don't know what is he talking about. I is don't it... know. Either. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, I don't know what incubus and succubus are. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't reply, re respond Pastor, to the question. Incubus, succubus spirit is, uh, is a spiritual. Uh, husband, spiritual husband and spiritual wife. Oh. Oh, I'm reading the question now. Yeah. Someone's Christian and every night the person's attacked by Inca. Well, um, I, you know, I'm so simple. I guess I, I don't have, since I don't know what it is and you're, and you're going to know the depth of my, of, of my, uh, of my ignorance very quickly. Uh, my answer to anything that's a spirit is to tell that thing to leave in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. and never change my opinion about it. Yeah. Never, mm -hmm. never entertain it. Uh, mm -hmm. Never, never do anything. Now, maybe, you know, there's something deeper and someone that's, that could tell them you've got a stronghold in your life that's causing this. I really don't have a lot of experience with that. All I know is that, that it, it's not from God, you know, it's not yeah. from God. It's, it's an yeah. unclean thing. And mm. so uh, you you uh, you tell it to leave. And if there's any uh, appetite in your life that you're you're involved in, if you're uh, if you're looking at lustful material, if you're looking at things that uh, make you dissatisfied with the person you're married to, stop doing whatever it is that might be giving that that devil an opportunity. You know, Ephesians four says, "Don't give the devil an opportunity." And I suppose that would if that would apply to whatever this kind of spirit is. That's a it's you know a, acting acting like a spouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh yeah, you know, just tell it to go. <laughs> Perfect answer. My mom did you know, she my mom was very simple. She told me one time after she became a Christian, she said, Son, here's how I do it. She said, The devil will come to me and knock at my door. And when I see it's the devil. I say, just a minute, Mr. Devil. And then I turn around and I say, Jesus, the devil's here and he wants a word with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, simple but effective. <laughs> Some husband will send their wife. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Mike, you mentioned uh, the divergent uh, marriage, huh? and you give an example of a couple in Singapore uh, who grew apart, 
because both were up to their ears in ministry. Uh, they were in charge of, uh, you know, different cells and they just moved differently. So, uh, yeah, but my question is, um, yeah, as a church, we would love uh, people who are very, very, very committed. No? But like in this case, um, you know, they will have to come a fine balance and some kind of what you call, how do we, you know, as a church, we have to take care of the health of um, members like this. So how do we navigate you now between wanting people to be very, very committed and, you know, give their very, very best and all their time. And yet we also have to look into this area where we may have to, you know, not give them so heavy responsibilities. Well, uh, there's, I believe that the church has to be intentional about helping families protect and develop their marriages and their family relationships. I believe that we have to be intentional about that, that we have to help them to, to know how to be invested in the work of God uh, to, a, to a reasonable degree, but never to the degree that they're sacrificing their family needlessly. Mm. Costa Deer, great man of God, told me one time, never sacrifice needlessly. So what we want to do is help people to know what are the, the necessary sacrifices and what are the needless sacrifices. That is one part of it. Uh, but then let me tell you about a conversation I had with Long Sek Leon many years ago. Uh, we haven't had too many conversations in our lives, but we've had a couple. Uh, and I knew him when he was first starting the Tabernacle before he was who he is today. I've known him a long time. And uh, I was in his office one day because I was ministering in his church at that time. And uh, he said, you know, Mike, if one of my board members' wife is going to give birth, uh, or if the, the board member is giving birth, I excuse them from all duties for, I don't know what's been, uh, the, the time specified amount of time, but he said, I excuse them from all duties for a period of time for them to be able to pay attention to each other and pay attention to the processes of bringing that new baby into their lives. He mm -hmm. said, I, 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 I tell, and you know what, what that told me about, uh, Reverend Ong Sek Liang, it told me that he is not just caring about the vision, he is caring about the people. Mm -hmm. And his people would know that. Mm -hmm. They would know that. Now, I don't know any more about it than that, because my little views of him are just here and there, you know, but that was the conversation I had with him that day, and I thought, how wise of you mm -hmm. to to give your people uh, the, 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 the time to step back. I also think that a a person, like the couple I talked about, when they went to their pastor, he gave them a spiritual answer, press through. Yeah. But that that pastor was well known to be a man who could live on four hours of sleep a night. Mm. Mm. We think he might have been a robot. We're not sure. Uh, he, 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 he had the, the, the capacity to do some of the things that he did, and he could do them for a long time. Uh, but then... Uh, he also had a wife who would make sure that they got away and went someplace every now and then. So I really do think that you have to have wisdom. And, you know, Pastor Allen and Pastor Leonard and Pastor Nelly, you guys, all of you and some others here, James, you've been pastors in churches longer than I have. So you know, you know, how this looks in real, in reality. But it does seem like if I were, if I were on your church staff and I came to you and said, I am absolutely and totally overwhelmed right now. Uh, I've got two audits waiting at work. Uh, my wife is sick, uh, mm -hmm. and one of my children is having exams. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that I can step back for a while? The loving mm -hmm. thing for you to do would be, of course there is. You yeah. Know? And let's find a way to make that happen. And by the way, how can I pray with you? Yeah. You know, what can we do to help? Because we are, we are many things as the church, but all of it is predicated upon being a family. We are yeah. a family joined to God. By the mm. spirit and and mm -hmm. he is our father yeah so uh now see i like I'm, I'm trying to be very very careful about this because i haven't had to do this uh in 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 uh, larger church situations of any kind i'm i'm kind of well you know what i am right but but uh but that's that's what i would hope i would see happen in those situations and i really do believe that the pastor of that church at that time missed it with that couple uh they were in crisis and there was nobody that they could talk to that crisis about or that they felt that they could, you know. So, 
Yep. Uh, yeah. Mm. Does that answer to you, Machin? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and you're most, uh, you're most welcome. <laughs> And may, the of may, ignorance. <laughs> may, may we never be the church that emphasizes performance over relationship. Oh, seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, may we never be caught up with performing, performing at the expense of personal life. Uh, it's very important. You know, sometimes uh, red flags are all over, and yet we are so focused on performance, we don't read the red flag. You know, yes, marriage yes, going down, yes. relationship turning bad. So may 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 God help us, you know, as a church that we will not go that way, you know. Yes. Uh, so praise God. Amen. Yeah, One last one before we go. We are almost hitting 10 o'clock. <laughs> Very good. You must all want your supper now. It's a <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Malaysian and I want my supper. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. Uh, no, no, it's okay. We look Any forward to for next week again. Yeah. All right. Doctor, can you pray for us before we go, Dr. Gun? Amen. Dr. Gunt, amen. Nice amen. You. Thank you, Pastor, for an enlightened evening. And also, I think very clearly speaking from the experiences of the Holy Spirit prompting us. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this evening that we had a chance to really understand some of the things which are happening around us, spirit of intimidation and uh, spirit of abuse, the spirit of control. And Lord, we just thank you that we uh, at least have an idea as to how we can handle situations like this. Amen. Lord, even as we depart from here, give us a good night's rest mm -hmm. and we'll come again next Thursday. We mm. give thanks in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Pastor Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Mike. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you. Good night. 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 God bless everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Pastor Nelly.